where your child is at when it comes to their academic and functional performance. Teachers, are you worried about where the students are gonna be at during this school year? That's exactly why I brought Charm with me to the Special Education Inner Circle Podcast. I'm your host, Catherine Witcher, and Charm, thank you for being here today. No problem, I'm excited. I definitely wanna share a lot of this information with you guys. So I'm excited to dig in because this has been a hot topic through our Special Education Inner Circle members, with our Master IP coaches. We're coming out of crisis, we're leaping back into the school system, and everybody's scrambling of where to start. So can you start by telling us how did you end up at an IEP table? Well, I started many years ago. I worked as a communication specialist. My bachelor's is in communication sciences and disorders. Um, my son was having some difficulties in school and I wanted to understand more and better ways to support him. Um, I was tired of everyone telling me things that I didn't understand. So I switched gears and I completed my graduate degrees in special education, um, school psychology. So I am a licensed school psychologist. I've worked as a director of SPED, as a school psychologist independently, and I currently have an agency in Indiana that supports many, many states um, with related services. And I have ended up at the IEP table here based on a lot of recommendations. So I am excited to provide a lot of the information I've known and learned over time. Yeah, so for everybody who's listening, I hope you caught all of those credentials because they're important for you to know that she's not just speaking from one perspective, that Charm has, you know, she's talking as a mom, she's talking as a special ed director, she's talking as a psychologist. It's like, this is a wealth of information. So it's like, if you're driving right now, just make sure that you make a mental note that you're going to have to come back with a journal and listen. If you are, you know, at home, put that paper and that pen nearby, because you're going to want to jot down some of these nuggets as we get ready to leap back into what possibly could be honestly the best school year ever if we can get on track. So where are you starting at um, Charm when people are like I don't know where my child's at now we can do things in person um, and let's just step back for a minute. We, t we had a little side chat before I hit record here we we're talking about how different it is state to state so let's give some comfort to some people. Some people are going to say they're all good, like they've been in for a while and some have not. Can you just share a bit of that experience um, from your perspective? Definitely, I live on the border of Indiana, so I service Indiana and Illinois, licensed in both states. Um, so I'm also a practicing psychologist along with everything else I support and do. While practicing in Indiana, we really didn't miss a beat. A lot of our schools stayed in, um, there were low numbers, some decided to stay online. And when it came to evaluations, it just made it a lot easier to receive the evaluation request, review the request, see if there were long-standing concerns and be able to evaluate them. The students will come in or we would see them in the building. In Illinois, it has been a lot more difficult because none of the schools were in until usually around the ones I support, which is quite a few, um, around March. And that means that is a lot of time, essentially almost a year out of school. Um, we love our parents and what they have done with being supportive, but we're all learning. And there has been a lot of gaps based on that. When students were in an evaluation process, it was hard to get them in, parents are working. So many variables have played a part in that. So it is different from state to state with what is available and students being in or out. Okay, so let's talk about this um, situation, whether, whether you're in school or out of school for that year, 12 to 18 months. Um, we're still, you know, we're always looking, I should say, we're, we're always looking at where's a child at and how are they performing. Sometimes we have to prioritize a little bit more than others, meaning we can't have um, thousands and thousands of kids and their families requesting full evaluations and have a quality education happening at the same time, like full force. Like there has to be some type of prioritizing. We'll get there, we'll get to everything. I'm never saying give up or settle. I'm saying let's prioritize. Is there a way that you, when you're talking to families can help them see like, here's where we need to start? Yes, definitely. When I get a request, <clears throat> the first thing I look for is data. Without data, all we have is an opinion. Um, I can see my children and say, oh, I need to look at these areas. No matter what, everyone has to understand, everyone has a deficit in some area. It may be sitting still, it may be in math, but not in science or reading. And when we look at scores, that's why the annoying test that parents say, I can't stand standardized assessments. 
but it does give us a baseline to see where they are performing. When you get the paper in the mail, it may look a little crazy and you're like, I don't even know how to understand or read this. We're looking at myself, we're looking at baseline data and we're looking at what's called a bell curve and the percentile ranks. If a student is under the 25th percentile, that is pretty low. We need them to be within 25 to 75 percentiles. That means they're within the average range. A parent may say, well, it's still difficult for him to do his work, but if it is not impeding his ability to perform in the general education classroom along with his peers, then that's not a disability. We're trying to see if students are disabled. So I, I go in depth. I don't just send them a piece of paper. I call them and say, hey, mom, this is what I'm looking at. If it's not just academic, there are some behavioral concerns. Even if they are performing academically well, if the behavior is making it difficult for them or their peers to perform, we will definitely move forward with an evaluation. But barring everything that has occurred, we have to look at many different factors in order to say this child is disabled based on the data and based on our testing. So I hope that you guys heard that as parents, we're looking at things that are below the 25th percentile to prioritize those. Again, that doesn't mean that we might not see something in the 40th percentile that we go, oh, we can take something from good to great or from okay to better. We can always work on those things, but we're talking about prioritizing coming out of the wackiest time in education that we've had and getting back to some stability. So if there are scores that are below the 25th percentile, that's what I'm hearing you say is like, like let, let's prioritize those first. Now, what happens when we don't have that, that data and we're like, you know, as a teacher, so now speak to me as a teacher. I'm like, okay, that's great. Like that you, you know, want me to look at below the 20, 25th percentile. Um, I have a caseload. I want to take some data. Um, this parent, you know, let's just say has requested an official evaluation. So I have to get this done. You know, again, there's some leeway. People don't know this. Let's just tell a secret. There's some leeway on what teachers can choose on how to test different domains. You've got domains and you've got these areas you need to test. And then we figure out like what needs to happen next. Do you have suggestions for teachers taking data? So you're the psychologist, but they got to do some work for you sometimes to make sure that, that you have data to go off of. Where do teachers start? So that is an amazing question, because when we look at data and we look at what teachers are able to obtain, the number one thing that has occurred, kindergarten and first grade evaluation requests. I have received so many. Um, and think about it, they haven't been exposed to school really. That's during the foundational time. And a lot of what we learn is rote memorization from our peers. We're at the table, we're in the circle, we're singing. That is difficult. I can't sit at a computer and listen that long, let alone a student. So parents are saying they don't know their ABCs or they don't know these things. So there is no data for us to really look at because we haven't had them in person. And if teachers are trying to get that data online, it's difficult. So when looking at teachers that are within the school realm, outside of those that have been online forever, we ask teachers to build um, <clears throat> look, utilizing different systems that are used in the class. RAS Kids is a program that has been used. When it comes to different levels of, if it's iRead, looking at that, whatever they have been able to build and looking at the work completion. I do have one-on-one -on -one conversations. If a teacher is saying they don't know phonetically different things, um, the best thing is to have a good solid RTI process, which is a whole nother conversation. <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, oh goodness. I know. <laughs> Tell everybody what RTI is by definition, and then um, we'll schedule that next podcast for us to talk about it. <laughs> RTI is response to intervention. So that is all of the kids within the school get certain amounts of supports. Those that are struggling a little more get more individualized supports in group, then it builds. That is the most amazing. But when we do have team meetings, there are some schools which I love. If there's an evaluation request, a team meeting is called for different people. It can be a paraprofessional and a teacher and a parent so everyone can speak of those concerns. So it's not really heavily relate on relying on the teacher and their support or what they know based in the classroom. It's everyone to hear the concerns. Those are my favorite and the best. For teachers, you have to keep running records, logs. Um, if it's just, oh, they're not turning in the work, that's really not a deficit. We're looking for skill deficits what skills can they not do or what cannot be done within the classroom 
that requires additional support. And a lot of that within the last couple of years do will do to COVID, it has been more of that conversational piece. Um, if some kids are not even coming in to take standardized assessments. So we have to see, is it to a marked degree? Not around the same area as peers, but is it really a lot lower than their peers? Because we're saying they are disabled. That's also what I want people to understand. We're saying they're disabled under special education law to require the need for individualized instruction and support. Oh, Charm, you're going to go there. So I'm just going to take this conversation. I was going to ask you, first, let, let me just recap this real quick. Okay, so teachers, did you hear that? Keep your systems in place that you have been using. Use your systems, use your tools. And then she said, use your team. She's talking about parents and pairs and that. Use your systems, use your team. Okay, now you've brought it up twice. So I'm just going to talk about it. You're saying disabled according to special education law and criteria. This falls big on you because a lot of times we have that outside doctor's report, especially now we've got a lot of outside reports. I went and got my own independent education evaluation, didn't ask the school to pay for it, did it all by myself. I'm super proud as a parent because I got information and I'm going to hand it to the school and I know they're going to follow all the recommendations on that page. And then all of a sudden it's like, Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the difference between this clinical, I'm going to call it clinical medical, okay, and the, the labels that go there, and then we have educational eligibility. Now, you take it away. I'm going to try not to stay on this forever because this is the best topic to me because it is very difficult when parents do bring that in. I love that we have data because it allows us to have a baseline. But the best things for parents to understand is it is completely different from the medical model and the school model. We have different guidelines and laws. I have my own situation. There was a student autistic. He was diagnosed outside of the school. And when we saw him, it was based on a doctor. Doctors are amazing. We need doctors. Definitely go see them. Checking off a list saying, okay, he met this criteria. I'm diagnosing him on a piece of paper, autistic. And the parent brought it in. He went to a different psychologist and they were able to say, yeah, he does look autistic. But when he's in the classroom setting, academically amazing. He was able to interact socially with peers, understanding that autism, it does impact how you socialize with individuals outside of your parents. It can be friends, relatives, anyone. It impacts how you socialize. This student did not have any of those concerns. Mom brought it to school and said, I want extra help. We're looking for where that area of need was. Academically, A and B student. He was in the 50th percentile. There were no concerns. He had a lot of peers, but the parents said, well, this is what I have, so you need to do it. And it was a lot of recommendations that we do not cover in the school area. So there are outside therapists who can su provide support, which is also going into a different level of school-based speech therapy, school-based occupational, and medical. Medical is how you navigate your world around you. School is how we navigate the school environment. How you, this is the best thing, how you access the curriculum. Accessing the curriculum is learning what is taught to you by your regular teacher, by your PE teacher, all of that. If it impedes their ability to do that at school, then we understand that and we provide our own evaluation. We can review the outside evaluation we don't have to accept it because areas that we cover are based on school. They need to be done within the school environment, looking at observations in the classroom. It is more in depth and school-based. Medically based is regarding how they perform outside of school. Some parents say, well, he's crazy at home. He does this or this is wrong. And we understand that at school, we don't see those issues, but we can always, I feel like school is a team as well. We're gonna provide that support for outside recommendations because there may need to be some therapeutic intervention with a medical professional. But if it's not impeding their ability to perform at school, that's what we have to really look at that fine line. And a lot of parents, well, if it's medical, they have it. No, it's different. We do have different laws to follow. Yeah, so there's a medical diagnosis, there's an educational eligibility, and I wanna take it one step further because 
I can hear the conversation already where people are saying, but IEPs are not just for academics. Like it's not just about school. I preach all the time on the purpose and findings of IDEA law, provide an appropriate education, meet unique needs, and prepare a child for further education, employment, independent living. Those are things beyond the school walls. So it's not just academic. So when we say we're limited as in we're different than that medical model, that doesn't mean that we're only talking about reading math science. When we're saying accessing, I mean, you mentioned what I did, like being able to sit still, being able to wait in line, being able to have that executive functioning. So share, like just kind of share your perspective on that because you spoke strong on your like, there is a line that we have to walk when it comes to this, but that doesn't mean that we're limited to academics. That is very true. Uh, my own son, he academically, he was very strong. And I think that made it difficult for him to sit, to attain in kindergarten. He wanted to get up, he wanted to walk around. And when I requested an evaluation, I was going finishing graduate school. They said, well, um, he's great academically. And I said, but we're getting calls constantly because he's walking around. He never hit, never violent, but he wouldn't stay in his area. He was always impulsive. He was walking around pulling different things because he wanted that sensory input which we hear a lot and that's OT based, but that is that overstimulation. He needed that. He needed a defined space. So what really helped support that was me again, switching gears, learning differently. But I went back to the school and said, no, it's not academically, but behaviorally there is a concern. Socially and emotionally, there is a concern. There are eligibility categories that are particularly for that. Even I've had students, 50th percentile, super smart, but in the classroom, it is hard for them to cope. The anxiety is very high, or there are social difficulties that make it difficult for them to talk, interact. So yes, they can learn, but we see an adverse impact behaviorally. So that can definitely be warranted. And I know there are a lot of psychologists that are saying, nope, if it's only, it has to be skill deficits. No, because I can do my work, but inside internally, I can't talk to my peers. I can't talk to my teacher. Um, and I'm nervous going into school and I cry or I run away. Any, all behavior is to obtain or get away from something, escape. So either I'm obtaining it by throwing something or trying to get your attention or I'm escaping it by leaving or trying to be ignored. Those are huge, especially with what has occurred with COVID. And there have been a lot of additional funds provided to help kind of assist with those things that have occurred. That's a whole nother conversation, but we do have to look at social and emotional factors as well. All right, so let's talk about the tools that you use in your toolkit or have used in the past. Um, you know, again, this is nationwide we're talking. In fact, we've got listeners and master IP coaches like in Canada, in England. Okay, so this is, you know, gonna be heard everywhere. And when I think of standardized tests, um, as somebody, if I was not kind of schooled in the special education way, I'm thinking of, uh, I'm going to age myself, I don't care. Uh, I'm thinking of dot matrix kind of things, right? Like where I'm just like circling in the pencil things. I got to read a question. I have to take this. It's, it feels um, kind of torturous as a student. It's, it's, you know, I'm sure the teachers didn't like giving those tests either uh, in that. So we have our, our parents and you know what? Teachers sometimes have limited experience and what's available to evaluate a child too, because they only, you only know what you know. You only know what's in your district. You only know what, you know, that one class in college told you about it. Can you share what standardized testing might look like in a couple of different domains? So maybe an example for academic, and then we can kind of talk about an example for like social emotional, and then one for executive functioning. Just what does that gathering information and go ahead and name some tools that you might use in those three different areas? No problem. When I decided to go independent, um, I was looking at what is called Cute Interactive. That's through Pearson. Usually our tests, they can be a little daunting and we can provide them in separate sessions because we don't wanna overwork a student. We're looking at different areas for academic. We're looking at reading, writing, and math. And a lot of that is hand-based, it's on paper, but there are psychologists such as myself and a small number. Um, we now utilize Q Interactive, which is two iPads. It is more reliable and it increases validity because what do students do? They're always either on a computer, on an iPad, so they're more open to do it and it moves faster. And for psychologists, please look into it. Q Interactive by Pearson. Um, I provide WISC, which is a Westland Intelligence Scale for children. It looks at how you understand information that's presented to you. That's verbal information and it's abstract information. 
when looking at executive functionings, functioning, if I see deficits in memory, working memory, I can see that it will be difficult in other areas. I couple those cognitive assessments with different social and emotional, emotional assessments. My favorite is BASC, um, Behavior Assessment Scale for Children. It is amazing. And I provide all of these remotely. So teachers, oh my God, I have another thing in my, to in my mailbox. No, I send it through an email. You can click it on your phone. Parents can click it. There's a parent rating. It's in Spanish um, for teachers and even paraprofessionals because we love our parents. They put in hours and work diligently with our students. So there are things the teacher may miss. I may need from you as well. And also another one that I utilize that I love, the Vineland. Um, that helps get a lot of information background to see other things. We think, oh, if it's just academic or cognitive, no. Behaviorally, there's social and developmental history. Um, parents, when you don't wanna fill out those forms, they're important because there could have been an injury that occurred that could impact. There could have been an event that was really detrimental that didn't get supported. Someone that was really close to them could have died. That allows us as psychologists to look at the academic and cognitive factors, but also look at social and emotional development and what could have triggered different things. We have a developmental scale for children that's also sent online. The questions are really intense, but it gives us really good framework to look at and they're tried and true and research-based. Um, KTEA is another. It's amazing when you do it virtually or when you do it utilizing the iPads because it is quick. Um, we look at and we say research-based because we want to make sure it's been tried and true that it is appropriate and it is licensed. So there are publishers, WPS, we look at Pearson, they make sure all of their information is tried and true. Pearson is my number one go-to with everything um, because I can get reports right away, I can move, I can be more efficient, and I can assist more families because so full psychologists are very hard to come by. We are overworked, but we still need to do the best job for every student we evaluate. Uh, I love that so much. And let's talk about something that um, I know I hear a lot. Um, this evaluation is taking forever. Is that what I hear a lot, right? So like, it, and that's the chatter in like the teacher's lounge. Like, I don't know what's going on. Like this evaluation is taking forever. And now the parents all mad at me because they don't understand why it's gonna take 60 days and how come and what's going can you just like settle that for us a little bit? I mean, is it, I mean, I know some of it has to do with caseload and, and time management of that individual psychologist who's going to be doing those testing, but how long does testing typically take? Like, give us a scenario of like in a typical situation of it would take this. No, definitely perfect. So we have to understand, we do typically get 60 days, but we also have those students that have expedited evaluations. And expedited is if a student is going to get expelled, then they may want to say, hey, let's look and see if there was something that could be impeding their ability. So that goes from 60 days to now I may have 20 or even 10 days to provide that. And there are so many components. When I test a student, cognitive and academic are my main ones that I'm going in and testing. When I'm doing that with the, with the programs that I utilize, it used to be three to four hours. Now I can assess in an hour and a half to two hours utilizing the research-based tools from Pearson, which again is huge. And looking at all of the other components, teachers, I have to get teacher rating skills. I know they are annoying, but sometimes I have to go back constantly. So granted, my testing can be done in less than a day. I have to look through, score, and interpret rating skills from teachers, from parents. Parents may say, oh, I'll do that later. They ask for the evaluation, but it takes them quite a bit of time to return the information. So a lot of our timelines is us fishing for information, trying to get it. Hey, did you complete this? What's going on? Um, social histories. We call parents, we talk to them. And we don't just have that one family. We have multiple. I have caseloads that can be 60 to 80 students within 60 days that need to be complete. Then I have teachers saying, hey, can you come in my class and view this kid? So it's not, we're sitting at a desk all day. We're supporting, we're in meetings, we're in evaluation request meetings. We are speaking to parents. If there's a tragedy that occurred with a family, we have to stop, put this down, go and take care of it. That's why the state has allotted these additional days for us to do it because it's so many factors and we type a lot of stuff up. So that takes time. And it is, there are some we are able to do early and get done because we have those parents that are, I've done it right away as soon as we send it. We love you. 
those who do that, please. <laughs> the teachers that do that, we love it. There are sometimes I have to send 10 to 15 emails like, hey, can you take care of this? Even when it was hand scored, it was worse because we would have to put in the mailbox and go constantly check the mailbox and go back and teachers, oh, I forgot. There are so many components. It's not just the school psychologist. It is teacher, it is parents. All of us have to come full circle to say what the student needs and be able to effectively say that they are disabled per the law and this is how we will render services. There are times if we've gone to the table without items, we can't successfully say that we have a full evaluation to be able to support them. So I know it may seem like, hey, just do this or do that, click, 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 but it's so much more that goes into it. And there's so many more babies that do need to be supported. Absolutely. And I, and I do want to say that there are times where we end up at the table with not all the information, but we know that prior going to in, going in. And sometimes we've chosen that, right? Because we are in this crisis. We're like, okay, listen, like this child is not functioning in the general education classroom. We know there's a lot of things going on, but we need to at least get some data from some qualified team members so we can make some decisions so the child is not missing out on school. And then we can come back. So sometimes it is, I've seen it done in two parts before, or there's some done, you know, virtual kind of as a follow-up or virtual to get started, right? Kind of like, like a quick meeting, like, okay, let's put some band-aids on this because we've got some data and we can go back. So just hear that that, there's a lot of different options, but the ideal is that we put together this domain sheet. We've decided we're going to collect everything. We get it all done. We sit down and, and we use all the expertise at the table. And I want to just speak into the parents here for a minute. And, and I want you to understand that your expertise, those, those scales, that social background, those things are you know, equally as if not more important than what's going on that day when you got to see that child once or twice to do that. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to like write out your birth story for the sixth time that happens too. I'm just going to call that out. Like, see, like, like you, it's okay to like see report made in, you know, 2018. I already went through all of that during the last evaluation. Nothing has changed. You can cut corners a little bit parents and say if that part's already updated and then pick up where you left off. That's a really important conversation that kind of moves things along during that meeting of not repeating that health history that we've already said nine times, but there's ways to make this all work. And Charm, I just want to say thank you for, you know, bringing us those concrete tools and like naming the names of like, I don't know where to start. I don't know where to look. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what to request. That's where you guys said, I said, you got to take some notes, like go back, write down some of these things. I'm going to have all the links on how you can get a hold of Charm and, and figure out what she does and how you could possibly use her expertise wherever you're located and, and see how you might be able to connect. Um, I'm going to ask you, Charm, for one last word of encouragement for IEP teams as a whole. Parents, teachers, admins, therapists who are going to be coming to the table completely overwhelmed with this concept of an evaluation. What are your words to them as they take a deep breath and try to go forward? During these times, it has been very difficult for everyone and being able to so support our students as a parent, I always say, what can I do differently as a parent? We all have to say that. As teachers, what can we do different, differently? How can we differentiate instruction? And if we've tried ABCDFG and it hasn't worked, then how can we come together? When it's one person, you don't have all of the answers. I don't have all of the answers. So having that solid team is amazing. And we always start with the good. We start with the positive, what they can do, what they are good at, and not what's bad, but what can we help support? How can we support Jason to be able to have good executive functioning skills, to be able to plan and complete assignments? Let's look at the good and how we can support that. And even with our older kiddos, let's ask them, bring them into the table to allow them. It's about them. Sometimes we talk around them. Let's include everyone. That is one of the best ways to provide the best support. That was like four tips in one. I love it. Like everybody has, I'm like, okay, listen, so we have to, it's like, I should have been taking notes here so I could repeat them back. But did you guys get that? Like start with the good and then make sure you figure out how to support and then make sure you ask, what can I do different? And make sure you're including the child in the decisions. Like, bam, there you go. Like have a good school year. Let's do it. So that summed it up perfect. Charm, I want to say thank you for being here and um, helping out our listeners to figure out what they can do next to provide that appropriate education. Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, everyone, we'll talk to you next time.